sorry, ma'am, I cannot, I'm unable to complete your call right now. Could you call back later? All I can say is just keep Thank trying, you, put your call through. You're calling Virginia? Thank you. Have a good day, sir. Merry Christmas. The commission was able to place most of the charges, the increased rates, on competitive, non-basic services provided by Bell, with the balance of those increases going to non-competitive, non-basic services, and as a result, the monthly telephone bill, which the customers of Southwestern Bell receives, will not be affected by this rate order. When most folks think of Bill Mitchell, they think of a barber in Lindsay. But Bill has another occupation on the side. He's a watermelon farmer. Bill started helping his father-in-law, Boob Smith, raise watermelons on this land many melons ago. This farm is located near the Kreiner community in McLean County. Bill says this year's watermelon crop is down about 50%. He blames the dry weather and he says the number of melons planted is down considerably. And he feels it's because so much manual labor is required to raise watermelons. Watermelons, they taste so sweet. Watermelons, they're so good to eat. From a little seed in the ground, they'll grow big and round. It takes a while to pick them. But it's a pleasure to eat them. Watermelons, they taste so sweet. Watermelons, they're so good to eat. I tell you, that really looks good. Do you think there's an art to raising good quality watermelons? Yeah, there is as far as, uh, uh, Knowing when to plant and when to spray and uh, and what varieties to grow, there's there's quite an art to it. What seems to be the most difficult uh, problem you have when you you're raising watermelons? Trying to get a stand early in the spring, get, getting them up is the biggest problem we have. Watermelons, they taste so sweet. Watermelons, they're so good to eat. Everybody likes them. Take some work to keep them away, but that's how it goes. It takes a while to grow them, but you can bet he's proud to show them. The watermelon man is always in demand. Cause watermelons, they taste so sweet. Watermelons, they're so good to eat. Watermelons, they taste so sweet. Ben McCain, Action 4, near Kreiner in McLean County. They're so good to eat. Fort Cobb Reservoir supplies drinking water to Chickasha, Anadarko, and other communities. 
It's also a recreational center for hundreds of people. There is a tremendous amount of water weed in the reservoir, and officials want to use the chemical 2,4-D to destroy it. The chemical application has been rescheduled for Sunday. However, that may change depending on the outcome of a hearing here at the federal courthouse Friday. Attorney Barbara Rausch represents a group called Citizens Against 2,4-D and the Sierra Club. What we're asking the Bureau of Reclamation to do is to file a total environmental impact statement, at which point they would have to look at the new research that's available on the chemical 2,4-D. Research studies have shown that 2,4-D causes genetic mutations and birth defects in laboratory animals. 2,4-D is the other half of Agent Orange. We've just now begun to find out the side effects of 2,4-5-T, which is the other half of Agent Orange. And my clients believe, and research studies show, that putting 2,4-D into a public water supply would not be a wise thing to do. And that's why the application of the chemical has been postponed several times this summer. However, officials at the reservoir feel it's necessary. In fact, they say the water weed is a hazard to boaters, skiers, and swimmers. And they don't feel the chemical will be harmful to the water supply. Ben McCain, Action 4. Thursday night about 10.30, five youngsters were walking along the shoulder of this highway in Caddo County. A small red car struck and killed three of the children. The other two escaped injury. Law officers are putting in a lot of time investigating this tragedy. Doyle Mills with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol says he's hoping some new information will lead to an arrest and conviction. We have ran down several leads and at the present time we have two cars impounded which uh, we have taken what we think is blood samples off the cars and we don't have the laboratory uh, test results back yet. Extra officers have been called in on this investigation and because of that more than 30 people have been processed through the Caddo County Jail. There were a lot of public drunks and that sort of thing. But, uh, as far as uh, all that crackdown, that's actually not on drunk driving, that's not actually what this was meant to do. It's uh, the extra units were here to help investigate this incident here. The three youngsters killed were all related. Two of the boys were brothers from Fairfield, Ohio. They were visiting their grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Reeder, at this home near Gracemont. Their cousin, he lived nearby. They've been identified as seven-year-old Jamie Yader, 10-year-old Shannon Yader, and nine-year-old Anthony Holder. A $1,000 reward is being offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for this act of violence. Ben McCain, Action 4, near Gracemont in Caddo County. About 12 o'clock Tuesday morning in Norman's exclusive Brookhaven area, Bob Moore of Cadillac fame thought he heard someone trying to break into his house. He called Norman police. When they arrived, they almost immediately arrested a suspect in the hallway. They searched the house and later found another suspect hidden in a closet. Norman police officer Roger Jennings was placing the cuffs on the second suspect when he broke away from him and ran out the back door. Jennings pursued him, fired three shots, two of them hitting the suspect. An ambulance was called, but by the time it arrived, the suspect was already dead. Killed was 18-year-old Randy Henson. Today, the Cleveland County District Attorney's Office cleared Officer Jennings of any wrongdoing. After reviewing the facts, it was two things were apparent, and that was that he was definitely in the process of apprehending a fleeing felon. Uh, the suspect had a large amount of cash on him that belonged to Mr. Moore and was in Mr. Moore's money clip and found on the body. And secondly, that the officer had reason to believe that he was armed and dangerous. But only about two blocks away from where the unfortunate incident occurred, Randy Henson's mother does not think the shooting was justified. She thinks that it was a culmination of three and a half years of police harassment. The judge was 
There were already two burglary charges pending on young Henson, but his mother says they were trumped up by a police department out to get her son. They'll decide that we're going to get this particular child. I mean, um, that's been told to me from juvenile authorities right on up to judges, and along with their sympathy, it's too bad it had to be Randy that they selected this time. Um, that's why I'd like to get something done before they had time to select someone else to take his place. Randy Henson's funeral is scheduled for tomorrow at 1 p.m. However, it won't be held here at Norman's IOOF Cemetery. He'll be buried somewhere near Slaughtersville because, his mother says, she doesn't want to lay him to rest in the town that hounded him. Ted Brown, Action 4 in Norman. Bob Allen of Edmond is a beefalo breeder. You're probably wondering, what is a beefalo? Well, this is a beefalo. Promoters of this breed say it's 3 8 bison and 5 8 bovine. About 100 members of the International Beefalo Association are meeting in Oklahoma City this week. They're hoping to develop a good promotional plan for their breed. The president of the association says there is a definite advantage to raising beefalo. We think the biggest advantage of beefalo is their ability to convert roughage to meat. Right now, the American cattleman is feeding a lot of expensive grain to produce meat. We can feed less grain and more roughage and produce meat that meets consumer acceptance. Hey, partner. But a number of cattlemen in the country say the entire beefalo program is a farce. President Eubanks admits there are a lot of critics and he says that's because there just isn't an abundance of scientific evidence on the beefalo. However, he added, that's going to change. Ben McCain, Action 4. The Veterans Hospital was built back in the 1950s under the federal construction codes of the time. But in 1971, an earthquake leveled a VA hospital in Southern California. Now the government wants to make sure that doesn't happen again. The VA hospital in Oklahoma City will be reinforced with concrete 12 inches thick at a cost of $2 million. Uh, it's not that it was so old, it just did not have the uh, construction uh, strength that uh, you would design into a building that would meet the earthquake activity of this area. If an earthquake ever did hit, a lot of patients in the hospital would be immobilized and unable to seek shelter. Two million dollars seems like a lot of money to spend reinforcing the building, so we went to a Norman geologist to find out if he thinks the money will be well spent. That uh, because of the uh, high incidence of earthquakes in Canadian County and because this also has been an area in the past of of a large earthquake that uh, it'll be money uh, well spent. Dr. Ken Luza says, unknown to many people, Oklahoma has a lot of earthquake activity, with 15 to 20 quakes occurring this year, although people didn't feel them. He says there are four particularly prone areas, and Oklahoma City is right in the middle of them. There is a high frequency of, of earthquakes that occur in Canadian County in this region of the state. The largest known earthquake occurred in this location on the map in April of 1952 and it was felt as far north as Des Moines, Iowa and as far south as Austin, Texas. Since this 1952 is a long time ago and another big earthquake could be due. But in the meantime, the Veterans Hospital is bracing itself. There you go, that's perfect. Bella Shaw, Action 4. The resolution, if passed, would prohibit any new building permits being issued in the downtown business district. But it would not affect those already granted. This moratorium on building permits would last 90 days. 
Jack Malkey, the Chamber of Commerce Economic and Development Director, says merchants are wanting this resolution passed in order to maintain Edmonds' identity. Then they'd like to develop a master plan for the downtown area. In developing this master plan, they feel that they need a little bit of time, such as 90 days, to come up with a plan, but they're afraid of, that something might happen in the meantime. So uh, in order to get a little bit of insurance that nothing is going to happen, they're asking for a 90-day moratorium on all types of uh, construction in the downtown area. But some Edmond realtors are opposed to the 90-day moratorium on building permits in the downtown business district. And they plan to make city officials aware of their feelings at this evening's 6.30 council meeting. Ben McCain, Action 4, Edmond. I think the legislation that was passed by Congress, uh, both in the, the tax bill and also in the reconciliation bill, were probably two of the most significant pieces of legislation that passed this country probably in the last 40 or 50 years. Senator Don Nichols had a lot of good news for Oklahoma taxpayers, especially oil producers and royalty owners. The tax cuts approved today will save them hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, for persons uh, who have royalty incomes, basically of less than $25,000 a year, will pay no uh, windfall profits tax. They'll still pay personal income tax, but they won't pay windfall profits tax. And then in the year 1985 and 86, when it goes to three barrels per day, that figure will increase to about $38,000 a year before they have to pay windfall profits tax. So I think you realize the significance. But the heart of the tax bill is a three-step permanent reduction in individual income tax rates. Both rich and poor alike will get a 25% tax reduction over the next three years. The first cut comes in October. For the majority of people, the, the wage earners, the, the working people of this country, I think it's going to be a real uh, boom for it. It's going to let people keep a little more of their income. Nichols also told reporters that the ceiling on the inheritance tax quadrupled from $150,000 to $600,000. Now that measure will help keep heirs from having to sell family assets to pay the inheritance tax. Mark O'Neill, Action 4, Downtown Oklahoma City. They shut those down, then it's economically very seldom is it feasible for them to... I'm Bella Shaw. As the morning deadline approached, members of the Air Traffic Controllers Union, PATCO, waited inside union headquarters. They wouldn't let any reporters or photographers inside. But when the deadline passed, cheers rang out. We were able to find out what happened from AFL-CIO State President Joe Johnson. Well, there were no sobs. There was a, uh, looking at the people's faces. They were determined, and they were they cheered that the 10 o'clock had come, and it was a deadline that they, no doubt, they feared. But uh, they they're ready to fight to fight the battle. Most of the controllers and their families have been afraid to talk about the strike. There is a restraining order forbidding comment. They could go to jail. But that didn't keep one man from holding a news conference to state their position. We, the air traffic controllers of the state of Oklahoma are uh, on strike against the unsafe conditions of air travel in the United States. We are unified in this effort and are strong. Although very few of the striking air traffic controllers have returned to work, we are still of one accord. We believe our fight is justified and our cause is right. Bray was asked, what do they do now? The strike just isn't over whenever I'm fired. I have nothing else to do. I haven't been trained anything. I will eat. I will sleep. I will survive. So the members of PATCO remain firm to strike, saying the American people will suffer for it, that the airways will no longer be safe. But this isn't the final chapter in the strike story. It could drag on for many months to come with legal battles. Bella Shaw, Action 4, at the Union headquarters.
This is a lab at the Civil Air Medical Institute, and they're testing urine for stress. Numerous chemical studies are conducted to see just how much stress is involved in being an air traffic controller. These lab technicians can measure the amounts of certain chemicals the body releases in pressured situations. The medical people here measured the stress levels of controllers all across the country and found the stress levels no different than the stress levels of other high-pressure jobs. They're not under any unusual or extraordinary level of stress. Now, if you take individuals who are suffering from some disease condition and hold them up as examples of the whole population, then you create a misperception of stress in air traffic control. And another doctor had this to say about the supervisory people filling in for striking controllers. We have no indication that the people who come and spend this amount of time non-active um, in working the boards that return to the field are under any undue stress due to the fact that they had been away from active control for any period of time. And the doctors say if the air traffic controllers are susceptible to anything, it's high blood pressure. And they stress that too can be found in other jobs. Bella Shaw, Action 4 at the FAA Training Center. Officials at Fort Cobb want to destroy this water weed. They say the chemical 2,4-D will do the job. In fact, they know what the herbicide can do. They've used it before. All the board members live in Anadarko <coughs> have been drinking the water all these years. We drank it through the previous applications of 74, 5, and 6 with no ill effects whatsoever. The chemical itself is health hazardous. Citizens against 2,4-D definitely believe that. And that's why they've protested the chemical application. They don't want it in their water supply. But reservoir officials say if they aren't allowed to destroy the weed, it will affect the quality of water, and it will continue to be a health hazard to those involved in recreation at the reservoir. If the judge rules in favor of the application, officials would be free to use it in other Oklahoma lakes. Ben McCain, Action 4. You might have come across this ad in the Sunday Oklahoman. The ad says thank you to the working on the job air traffic controllers. I think that the people in the towers, these are the pilots I think responsible for the advertisement. The they're all commercial pilots and they're all mad. Mad at the publicity they say the striking controllers are getting. These men say the skies are as safe now as they were before the strike. You won't see us out there flying if it's unsafe. And those striking uh, PATCO controllers that are telling you that it's, uh, it's unsafe are just telling you a, a bold-faced lie. They've created the impression with the American public that pilots cannot leave the ground without total air traffic control. And that is an absolute falsehood. The guys that are working today are the professionals. They understand what they want to do. They understand they have a contract and they're not supposed to strike. These are the guys that are working today. The pilots also say they support President Reagan's decision to fire the striking controllers. The strike is also hurting small aviation companies. The private commercial jets are often bumped and airliners carrying hundreds of passengers given priority. We're off about 20 percent. We've still got to do business and all the corporations that we do business with will continue to do business. So I think we'll be back to normal very shortly. I think the government's taking every step they can to get us back to normal operation again. The, approach is Juliet closed. the people involved with smaller commercial aviation don't like the conditions that have been thrust upon them. They'd like to be able to fly whenever they want to, but at the same time at least one group would rather wait for an entire set of new controllers to be trained and begin manning the control towers than have the striking controllers rehired. Mark Hardy, Action 4, near Will Rogers World Airport. The 
unfriendly skies over Canada have had little effect on Oklahoman's air travel. Several airlines that serve Will Rogers World Airport both connected the flights to Montreal, Toronto, and Europe. But a check with local reservations agents showed no delays in Canada or Europe-bound flights. Airport advice for international travelers remains the same as for domestic passengers. I, I think our, our best advice that we could offer air travelers in Oklahoma going, trying to get into the European marketplaces uh, would be to stay in close touch with our carriers. The airlines right now are displaying a tremendous ability to accommodate the air traveling public. Put your trust in the U.S. carriers. World travelers who fly out of Oklahoma City have an advantage over flyers who depart from the East Coast. Most international flights in this part of the country fly nonstop from Dallas instead of New York, thus avoiding Canadian airspace. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Will Rogers World Airport. Compatibility between Oklahoma the City is shopping for a place to build a garbage transfer station. Under the proposal, 40 to 60 garbage trucks a day would dump their loads into self-contained trailers for shipment to a Southside treatment plant. The city has investigated more than 50 possible sites for the holding facility. One prime location is a vacant lot at Northwest 115th and Santa Fe. But many area residents don't like the idea of a trash transfer plant being built in their backyard. You still haven't pointed out to me why the site of 115th and Santa Fe, which is right next to residential areas, is a much better site than the site down there at Wilshire and Western. It's going to cost you more dollars out of your pocket and mine to buy that site and to manage it over the next 25 years than it will the site of 115th and Santa Fe. Number two, it is not located on a four-lane road. It's located on a two-lane road because to get to this site from the west, which is where the bulk of this refuse will come from, you have to come through the Nichols Hills area, which has a two-lane road throughout that area. Of course, no action was taken tonight. Tonight's meeting was merely informational. However, the Oklahoma City Council is committed to a north side garbage transfer station, and they will decide at their August 25th meeting whether to put that transfer station here at 115th and Santa Fe or somewhere else on Oklahoma City's north side. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Northwest Oklahoma City.